Yep. Okay. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Gonna move this slightly to the side. Not close enough to set that on fire. Metaphysical practice. You've all heard about metaphysical malpractice, right? Well, this is metaphysical practice. This is this is not what we shouldn't do, but this is what we should do. So Last week, um, and we had a big crowd, by the way, last week. For those of you who weren't here, uh, you can ease your guilt. Uh, it was, I don't know, I think we had 20 people here. It, but it was a wonderful 20 people. They, they were uh, full of uh, vim and vigor. We talked about letting go and letting God. And letting go and letting God is certainly a very appropriate practice. But it is not the only practice. I mean, uh, letting go and letting God could conjure up the image of us being couch potatoes, right? And we not participate in our experience, but rather we let just the experience flow and we bless everything is good and uh, our life goes to hell in a handbasket. Okay, so we are active agents in this divine activity. We are the active agents in this divine activity. There is an important lesson for us to learn as we consider these practices that have been offered to us by, by the Fillmores, uh, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, back in the, <coughs> in the middle, up to the middle of the 20th century, latter part of the 19th century. They are... Uh, truly American mystics, and they came forth with a uh, a set of practices and a set of principles that uh, really was uh, was a movement in consciousness during the latter part of the 19th century. Uh, that was when divine mind came about, uh, and certainly all of the activities of um, Emma, Emma Curtis Hopkins, who was really the mother of new thought. Uh, she had as her students the uh, the founder of Unity, of course, the founder of Divine Mind uh, uh, that uh, actually f started here in Colorado, um, and the founder of Religious Science. So Emma Curtis Hopkins was indeed a universal teacher of these principles, but Fillmore brought these principles uh, forth in a more, shall I say, uh, more Christian uh, context. Uh, he looked at the major uh, religions of the world. He found, as Aldous Huxley later wrote about, the golden thread, the golden thread of truth that, that permeates each of these major traditions. And he put that into the context of the uh, teachings of Jesus. Okay, so... Uh, Unity has a bit more flavor of Christianity than do the others, but uh, each New Thought ministry is really dependent upon the minister's uh, expression. So you'll find some Christian uh, New Thought in Divine Mind and also in, in Religious Science. Uh, Centers for uh, Spiritual Living, they're now branding themselves. So there's more to it than just putting our feet up and letting life happen. 
Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, uh, Dan Cathy. He was the uh, he is the CEO of Chick Fil A. Well, after the the uh, anti-gay falderall that happened a couple of years ago, he found that the sales of Chick Fil A were plummeting. So he figured, well, if there's anyone with substantial power uh, that could be an ally, it would be the Pope. So he, he called the Pope and he, and he said, uh, you know, uh, sales have been plummeting and, and I'd like to offer uh, your organization $10 million if you would just change the words, give us this day our daily bread to give us this day our daily chicken. And, and the Pope said, well, you know, that, that's, that's the Lord's Prayer. I couldn't possibly do that. And they ended their conversation. Another month went by and the sales continued to drop. And so he called the Pope up again. He says, look, I'll increase my offer, $50 million. And the Pope thought for a bit. He says, well, $50 million, that could do a lot of good, but... But uh, now it's, it's still the Lord's Prayer. And, and uh, so the conversation ended. Third month went by. Sales continued to hit the bottom. New and new bottoms each month. And, and so he called him back and said, Look, I'm desperate. A hundred million dollars. And you can, there, no strings attached. Just change those words to give us this day our daily chicken. And... Uh, the Pope thought a bit. Later, he called the bishops. He says, that, well, bishops, I have good news and I have bad news. Uh, the good news is that uh, we picked up the Chick-fil-A account, and the bad news is we lost the Wonder Bread account. <laughs> As we go through our lives and think that we are in charge and try to scheme ways for us to make better what we think needs to be better, grabbing for all we can get, if you will, we find ourselves in fear, in fear that we haven't done enough, in fear that somebody is going to see our maneuverings, in fear that something's going to happen out there that's going to cause our life to go to hell in a handbasket. Well, we have a, uh, uh, Shannon, my daughter Shannon, uh, had a middle school friend, um, uh, Kathy, Kathy Lee, I'm not sure what her, uh, what her name was then, I, I forget, but it's now uh, Kathy uh, Zingano. Now, I don't know whether any of you are followers of mixed martial arts, but there is a, um, there is a division of mixed martial arts, uh, a women's division, and there's different weight classes. And in the bantam weight class of the women's division, uh, Kathy Zingano uh, was uh, fighting for the title last night. Um, and so as I was preparing my talk or trying to figure out what I was going to talk about, actually, uh, clarify, um, <laughs> I was listening to the blog. I mean, th this was a pay-per-view on Fox 1, and I wasn't going to lay down 49 bucks to watch this. But nonetheless, I was curious as to, you know, here is uh, Shannon's friend from middle school whose uh, primary objective in life was to wrestle. And so she, in college, she got a wrestling scholarship, and she went on to be a mixed martial arts uh, fighter and uh, had compiled a substantial record. I think it was 10-0 in MMA matches. And so she had climbed up to the point where she was the uh, contender. And the, her opponent was um, Rousey. Ronda Rousey. Who, who said that? You followed it. You followed it. All right. Did you pay the 49 bucks? No, okay. So, so Ronda Rousey uh, is a uh, Olympic uh, champion, a uh, judo champion. And uh, so, you know, there was a lot of hype about this. And, you know, I was following the blogs and the Twitter feeds. And, oh, 
it was <laughs> there. Uh, you can imagine that there were all kinds of comments uh, for both uh, both opponents in this match. Well, uh, it turns out that the match started, and uh, Kathy Lee charged her opponent. Her opponent grabbed her arm, twisted it into an arm bar, flipped her up on her shoulders, and in 14 seconds, the match was over. Okay. Now, I, I, have, I have lost touch with Kathy Lee. I don't know whether or not she is a practitioner of new thought, but I'm guessing not. Uh, I'm guessing that she has, in fact, a pretty strong ego. Uh, in fact, it was apparent from the post in the Twitter feed that uh, there was a substantial amount of going on between the two of them as they came into the ring. And I'm not sure how you do that uh, in, the, in the context of love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. It, it, but uh, maybe, she, maybe she's in touch with that. But nonetheless, I'm going to suppose for the moment that she, wasn't, that she is not in touch with that so that we can use this as perhaps an illustration of what we go through. I mean, how many of you have had the experience where you have come into a competitive situation with a great deal of passion and vigor and found yourself to be put in an arm bar and on the mat in 14 seconds? Metaphorically speaking. Well, <sighs> so we go along in our lives and we attempt in our efforts to get our opponent in an arm bar and put them on the mat, right? In one way or another. And we wonder why it is that we are unhappy. Wonder why it is that we're living in fear. Wonder why it is that we have bad dreams at night wonder why it is that things just aren't going the way we think they should go. And, damn, why did that happen, right? Okay, so, how many of you know of Thomas Merton? Of course. Thomas Merton. Trappist monk, uh, following the Benedictine order. Uh, he was a popular Catholic Catholic mystic, reformer, social activist. Um, he lived from 1915 to 1968. He offered this prayer. My Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that the desire to please you does, in fact, please you. And I hope that I have the desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may not know, that I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always, though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death. I will fear not, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. A beautiful prayer. In fact, this is his mo said to be his most famous prayer. I had not run across it until I... Just recently ran across it. But this is a beautiful prayer. But notice the assumptions that are made here. There is very much, in my opinion... Now, this is coming from a Trappist monk, a mystic in the Catholic tradition. But, and, and, and a mystic, the, the, the motivation of the mystic is to experience God in this moment to experience God, to experience the connection with God in this moment. But this prayer, if we read it from a traditionalist view, is very much God out there overseeing and manipulating and guiding whatever needs to be done, and me down here, unaware, not, tr trying, to, not trying to figure it out, but nonetheless, not knowing where I'm going to be going, but I put my trust in you, O God. So there's very much this separation between us and God, which is contrary to the mystic's purpose, or at least the mystic's motivation. And so we look at this prayer and we say, yeah, that is beautiful. I can see how that could, that could come from the mind of an of a elevated soul. 
And we can't argue with his credentials. He, uh, he has changed many lives, and he's been the leader of many uh, seekers. But his prayer suffers from another God. And I'd like to, I'd like to uh, focus on this otherness for a moment. Charles Fillmore offered this, and, and you'll notice that I'm, keep, I'm working with Keeping a True Lent. Keeping a True Lent is, I don't know, the fourth or fifth book that Charles Fillmore wrote uh, out of his dozen or so. And it was intended to be a practice for the Lenten season, a metaphysical practice for the Lenten season. And in the, in the uh, fourth chapter, or the third chapter, sorry, in Keep a True Lent, Robert Ingersoll paraphrased, an honest man is the noblest work of God. Two, an honest God is the noblest work of man. He was not so far wrong. All inventions are first pictured in the mind of the inventor. So we form a mental picture of everything we conceive, and our conception of God is no exception. We do not see persons and things as we think we see them. What we see is our own conception of them, as it is with God. What we see is our own conception of God, right? We don't see God as God is. We see God as we conceive God to be. And that conception is indeed what, what determines our relationship with God. He goes on to say, We are forced by intuition, logic, and manifest evidence to the conclusion that the creator of the universe in which we live was and is wise and good. This being true, we cannot accept descriptions of him or his acts that contradict that primal conclusion. When we read that God is angry with the wicked every day, we question the understanding of the writer, although the evidence would tend to prove the assumption. The evidence will tend to the, prove the assumption that God is angry. I mean, uh, how many of you know Thomas Merton's means of departure from this incarnation? He was taking a bath on a trip in Thailand, and a radio fell into the bathwater. He was electrocuted at the age of 53. And one could say, well, he must have done something to piss God off, right? I mean, here he was, a wonderful expression of God's love, a leader of many who regarded him as truly being in touch, in touch with God. Yet he died as a result of electricity coursing through the water in the bathtub on its way to ground. What could he have done to piss God off? We have, in the New Thought tradition, we have this same stuff going on. The same stuff being, what did that person do to cause this event to happen? Right? I'm, I'm part of a, a Unity Ministers discussion group. And um, you might consider that Unity Ministers are going to be uh, practicing uh, what we teach. Well, uh, spoiler alert, that doesn't always happen, uh, particularly when ministers get together. <laughs> <laughs> when ministers that get together, any ego that has remained, and in, in, by evidence, there's a lot of ego that remains, that ego swells. Uh, that ego blossoms to, to the point of, uh, well, expressing whatever fragrance would come from that. But in this discussion group, a, a minister had joined the discussion group specifically to get some support from other ministers because this person was having difficulty with the board of trustees and, and she was having some, some issues that, that she was trying to get her handle around. She's trying to understand, right? So she came into the discussion group and the discussion group was by and large very supportive. You know, the, uh, I can understand your situation. You know, I've been through it before and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And the questions then ventured into the territory of, well, okay, what can you learn from this experience? You know, what is it about this experience that will lift you, will educate you, will allow you to avoid that in the future? 
a reasonable question. In fact, it's one that I suggest that we all use. I have had the opportunity to use that question often. And then the question came out. You know, it's just, it's just kind of like a, an ooze out of something that you're squeezing together. The question came out, well, what in your consciousness has caused this to happen? Stop! Malpractice. <laughs> Metaphysical malpractice. It's where we guilt shame either ourselves or others with the idea that we have control of every event that occurs in our life, whether it's as a result of our explicit and obvious actions, words, or thoughts, or it is something that is buried in our subconscious. Right? We need to weed that out. Well, I suggest that when we do that, what we're doing is we're dropping back into the ego realm, just hook, line, and sinker. We're grabbing the ego and we're saying, okay, ego, take me for a ride. Because what we're doing is we're using fear, we're using guilt, we're using shame as a means of manipulating our conception of God. Do you see? What is it in my consciousness that brought this about? Well, okay, there's that separation, me from God. I'm now obviously not in divine mind because I have brought this evil thing upon me. Shame, because, oh man, I've been studying this stuff for 30 years and I still can't get it straight. And guilt, it's my fault, I, I'm the one. I don't know what I did, but I'm, I'm obviously the one because it was something in my consciousness that brought this about. Okay. So metaphysical malpractice is something that we have the opportunity to implement often. And it, when we do, when we do, what we're declaring is we're declaring our separation from God and from each other because it's my fault, right? It's in my consciousness that created the stuff. Well, could it be that stuff happens? Could it be that events out in the world are, you know, they, they just as they are? Well, I mean, uh, look at Ronda Rousey. Ronda Rousey was a champion, a, a, a judo champion, an Olympic champion in her weight class. And one could say that when Kathy Lee charged into the fray that she made an error, but I, can, I could see her logic. She's going to think I'm going to size her up. No, I'm going to surprise her. Well, turns out that armbar on the mat, 14 seconds. What in her consciousness caused that? Well, it could be that she could have been a little bit more strategic, but well, that's the way it goes. But on the other hand, here was a, a champion, right? Someone who had defended the title four consecutive times, and she has proved herself. What was it in our experience that caused this stuff to happen? Well, stuff happens. The question is, how do we respond to what happened? That's where our metaphysical practice is focused. How do we respond to the stuff that happens? And the way we respond to the stuff that happens is going to come from our consciousness, right? It's going to be based upon our emotions. It's going to be based upon our intellect. It's going to be based upon past experience and an assessment of that past experience or not. It's going to be based upon things that are certainly within, and that is what we have control of. If I could carry my assumption on a little bit further, Kathy Lee probably woke up this morning and began kicking herself in the butt, in the, in the ribs and in the head, and, you know, wherever she could get her foot, because, because... 
she made a mistake. But now what does she learn from that mistake? You know, how does she go on from here? That's where the practice comes in. That's where our principles uh, take hold. And Charles Fillmore offered this. Yep. Let me go back. Do I want to use that? No. All right. Divine love is the force that dissolves all the opposers of true thought and thus smooths out every obstacle that presents itself. When love ascends the throne and takes complete possession of our life, its rule is just and righteous. Even destructive faculties such as resistance, opposition, obstinacy, anger, jealousy, and are harmonized through love. Perfect love casts out all fear. When love harmonizes the consciousness, we find that, an out, that our outer affairs are put in order and that where once there seemed to be opposition and fear, cooperation and trust prevail. So when we come upon these issues that happen where our faith is tested, daily word today, when we look upon those situations where events happen that are contrary to our personal desires, we can set our desires aside, come back to the principle that divine love is the force that dissolves all the oppo opposers of true thought and thus smooths out every obstacle that presents itself. Divine love. You see, we have a practice of loving others, right? And often that practice is based upon what others do. I love you if you. I will love you if you. I loved you because you, da, 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 right? And it, our love is contingent upon the other's actions, but that's not what divine love is. Divine love is this flow that comes from the heart of God through us, heals us, lifts us, transforms us, if we let it flow from us. Because that love that is coming from the heart of God that is stopped here and not expressed out there not expressed to God, not expressed to those around us, is not divine love. We have taken that divine love, that sacred trust uh, that is offered to us, and we have contorted it and distorted it, and we have, we have uh, um, violated it and made it a personal love contingent upon the actions of others. And that is not what divine love is. Divine love is that free flow that comes from the heart of God unconditionally into the experience. And when we allow that to flow, then our obstacles are dissolved. The rough spots are smoothed. We can move into this experience. The last recorded word. <laughs> Kathy Lee. Yeah. So instead of waking up this morning and proceeding to kick herself in all places that she could reach? What if she woke up this morning and said, wow, Rhonda is really good. That was an extraordinary performance, and I made a mistake. Yeah, but wow, she took advantage of it. Pick up the phone, give Rhonda a call. Nice job last night. Really a good job. I'd like to learn more from you. What if she took an approach of extending love and she may, she, may, she may have already done that. She may have already done that. But what if when you encounter something that doesn't go your way, what if your approach is, wow, that's interesting. I so expected the other to occur. But since this has occurred, how can I use this? How can I grow from this? How can I be an expression of love in this moment in light of this revised circumstance? Hmm. Fillmore offers this. The dissolving power of, lo of spiritual love is the antidote for a dictatorial will. But we must deny all selfish desires out of our love uh, out of our love before we use it in softening the imperious will. What he's referring to here is what I refer to as the ego. 
At that point in time, the ego had a very Freudian description. Uh, but I'm using the definition of the ego as offered by A Course in Miracles, which is said that is that aspect of consciousness which insists upon separation from God and from others. That's the definition of ego that I'm using. So the imperious will is what I call the ego. And Fillmore is looking at this, the selfish desires, those things that will augment or, or, or uh, uh, cause the expansion of my ego. Those are the things that I need to extract from this practice. And this practice then is going to allow me to respond to the events in my life, the stuff in my life, in a way that is going to allow me to grow and expand. And this is actually uh, page 30, not 21. Many persons wonder why they do not develop divine love more quickly. But here's the reason. They make a wall of separation between the religious and the secular, between the good and the bad. Divine love sees no distinction among persons. It is principle, and it feels its own perfection everywhere. It feels the same in the heart of the sinner as it does in the heart of the saint. When we let the truth of being into our hearts and pull down all the walls of separation, we shall feel the flow of infinite love that Jesus felt. And so this is the message that Jesus offered us, is to offer this divine love. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the practice of expressing divine love. Love it all. Learn from those things that you can learn from. Bless those things that you can bless. And in it all, be the expression, be the pressing out of divine love in all of your actions. So, I was talking to a friend this last week. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm having some health issues. I'm trying to figure out what it is in my consciousness that brought this about. And this person, he's been practicing metaphysical principles for years. We get caught up in that because we think that things are in our control. That's not it. Things are not in our control. The events are not in our control. Our consciousness is under our control. And how we respond to the events that occur in our lives, that is really the key, even if those events were caused by us. And in Kathy's case, where she ran into the fray, made that error, how does she respond to that error? Does she respond from a feeling of guilt and shame, or does she respond from a feeling of love, unconditional love? Seeing the experience as one that, oh, interesting, interesting. What can I learn from it? Well, Jesus offered this in Mark 9. He has quoted, how long has it been happening to them? Jesus was asking the father of a child that was suffering from epilepsy, seizures. And uh, the father said, from childhood, it has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, have pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you spirit that keep this body, boy from speaking and hearing, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out, and the boy was like a corpse. So most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he was able to stand. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast this out? And he said to them, this kind can come out only through prayer can come out only through prayer. What does that mean? You see, the disciples had attempted to pull the spirit out of the, the adverse spirit out of this boy. And so Jesus' admonition to the disciples that were unable to do it was this can only come out through prayer. 
But we in unity know that prayer is not about changing the circumstances out there. It's not about healing the boy. What's it about? It's about changing our own consciousness. Prayer is a transforming tool for changing our own consciousness. And it's not about being all prayed up so that we can, so that we can touch the event out there and transform the event out there and make it correct. It's not about that at all. Prayer is about changing our own consciousness and changing our own consciousness such that when that happens, when that stuff happens that is adverse, uh, that seems to be adverse to our experience, we can respond to it in a consciousness that is centered in God self, centered in the Christ light, that we can respond to the events out there in love. That, that is what this is about. Being, building and being a consciousness where we can respond to the events that happen in our lives with unconditional, unlimited divine love. Okay? So you don't have the responsibility of changing the events out there, but you have a much greater responsibility. And that much greater responsibility is to change yourself. We'll have our meditation. As we come into our meditation, let's come in with, I cast all my cares. Breathe in and breathe out. Open ourselves to this feeling of love as it moves through us, arising in the heart, expressing through our bodies, through our consciousness, and flowing out into this moment. Unconditionally, we offer this. No expectation of reward. No expectation of transformation of others. But fully aware of the transformation of ourselves. <coughs> Feeling this love through, flow through us. Feeling how it shifts our awareness. How it, how it softens our countenance. how it vitalizes the very essence of our being. Letting it flow unconditionally. Transforming our experience, not necessarily the events, transforming our experience of the events. Seeing love reflected in all things, even the adverse things. Seeing love reflected in the faces of even our opponents, our adversaries. Seeing love reflected from every face because we have expressed it. And in this awareness, we come back to this time and space, sharing the words of the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> 